Good morning. Please turn with me to Mark 4, verses 35 to 41. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. So here we are. Uh, Happy New Year. And uh, we kick off our new year looking at a new series of sermons talking about facing life with faith. And so this is the series for the next about six weeks. And after that, uh, we'll have uh, one week where we're just going to have family day and we're going to celebrate family day. And then after that, we hit right into a series on Lent preparing us uh, for Easter. So that's where we're heading as a church for our sermon series over the next few months. Um, So again, these things will be available on the website afterwards and everything like that. So facing life with faith. Now, all of us at some point, um, we exercise faith daily. Uh, It's not necessarily a religious thing. Um, It's sometimes just the very fact that a lot of you are sitting right now in a pew um, in great faith that it's holding you up. Uh, and, you know, as you go around in life, you experience all different kinds of ways in which you exercise faith. And, and all, all of it is done um, usually subconsciously, and we don't really think about it. Uh, but as we look at faith, uh, one of the things that we are going to do is try, we have to consciously start to think about uh, what it means for us to have faith, especially when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to God, when it comes uh, to Jesus. And so that's what this uh, whole series is going to explore, various kinds of faith that we're going to have. Now, if you're someone like me, um, sitting on a pew, that's easy. I have a lot of faith in a pew. It's solid. Um, You know, there's a lot of people who could sit in one. Um, Have you ever sat in those black chairs out there in the coffee area there? Those ones I don't have a lot of faith in. Um, They kind of bend, they're they're plastic, they they fold. Um, I I don't have great faith in those ones, right? And it's always based upon, um, a lot of times, your experiences. Now, this is a wonderful image of a person getting ready to go Uh, rock climbing. One of our hobbies um, with my kids is to go bouldering and rock climbing. Um, I would never expect and I would never have faith in my kids to actually harness me and belay me, would I? Um, Because if I miss and I go down, uh, that's about 250, no, I lost some, 230 uh, plus pounds coming down um, and a couple of kids trying to hold you up. That's not going to work for me. And, And so there's also the idea of logic and reason that we have as well. That you can look at something and say, you know, that's just not going to work. And and you, 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 you don't have faith in that. And you recognize that. And so all the time we're exercising faith in various different ways. And so today, um, as you have, uh, as we have our scripture today, but we're not going to stay in the scripture. We're going to examine various other scripture passages uh, today. So if you have a Bible, great. I'm going to encourage you to open it up, turn it on. If you don't have a Bible, uh, just uh, either shuffle to someone over you, or if you want, you can raise your hand. Uh, One of our ushers will go grab a Bible for you uh, from the welcome table. And if you need a Bible, just raise your hand and they'll get that to you. All right. So um, we're going to look at what it means to have a saving faith today. What is a saving faith? Now, this is the one thing that sets Christianity apart uh, from all the other kinds of things that you do day in and day out with regards to general faith, intellectual faith, emotional faith. Um, But we're talking about today what a saving faith would look like. But before we get there, I want to just sort of give you an idea of what your Bible talks about in various forms of faith that people have. And so here is um, an intellectual faith. Many of us have this in our day-to-day routines. It's commonly referred to as a natural faith. Anyone can have this. Any one of us can have this. For example, this intellectual faith is this. I believe at some point in history, a person named Jesus Christ actually lived on this earth. 
Now, it doesn't make a difference in your life. It makes no challenge uh, to how you live. It's just an intellectual thought uh, based on a historical fact that somebody named Jesus lived on this earth 2,000 plus years ago, right? And so many of us, whether you're a Christian or not, you can exercise this kind of faith. You look back in history and you say, oh, well, a lot of the historical, archaeological evidence points to the very fact that somebody named Jesus was alive uh, and lived in that time frame. And so many of us live and have this thing called intellectual faith. But as you take it one step farther from that, one step a little bit uh, closer to God, we start, uh, some of us, exercising what was called godly faith. Now, godly faith is the very fact that I start believing in the promises that God says. So when God says, I will never leave you, I, I kind of start grasping that intellectually, but I start believing that in how I live my life because when bad things happen, I know God is there with me. Or the very fact that says I, God says, I would provide for you. And, and you have that in your mind set that, yes, God is a God who will fulfill that kind of promise. And so, yes, I thank God for the very fact that I have clothes on my back, food to eat, a, a roof over my head, based on the very fact that I've been given employment or I have parents who have supplied these things, but it's through God. Right? And so we start to exercise from intellectual faith, knowing about something, to sort of trusting um, in God because he says he will do what he says he will do. And then the third one if from that, after that, is this thing called saving faith. Now, a saving faith is not just believing that God is going to do something. It's not that I understand God, but that I've entered into this dance with God. In that not only do I believe what he says, but I want to now have this relationship that goes with that. And then I start pursuing this relationship with God, not only trusting in what he says, but now I'm also acting upon the things that he would want me to do, the things that he is asking of me. And this is that thing we call then saving faith. The very fact that I have this relationship with him now and and I'm moving along uh, in this general relationship. So how do you have this relationship? Well, this is one of the things we started off with this year is we wanted to encourage everyone to start reading their Bible. Don't just come. We are a... This, this church, we're, one of the things we want to change about our church here is that we don't want you to be a preaching-oriented church only, right? That you come and you hear from someone who stands up here, and that should be enough for the rest of your week. No, you need to hear from God every day, right? And so we want you to move from a preaching-oriented church to a word-oriented church where you're in the Word of God, listening to God's Word, reading God's Word, absorbing God's Word. And that's part and parcel of that relationship, is that you would get into the word of God and listen to what God is saying, knowing what he's expecting of you and responding to that in a relationship with God. And the next thing to go with that is that you need to hear from God, not only through his word, but to dialogue with God in prayer. And we want to encourage you to have that relational dialogue in prayer. Because many of us, just think about the daily relationships you have with people, right? You interact with them. You have a conversation with them. And I often think that times, you know, if, if we just do things out of obligation, you're, you're tainting that relationship, aren't you? But we want to do this because we want to have this dynamic, wonderful relationship with God. And it's both in the word and in prayer. But here's the various levels of faith that I want to just highlight for you today um, that, that, uh, that many of us will struggle with. And I'm, just, I'm highlighting them for you because this is where we're starting. And this is our starting point for today. And as we go from here, we want to say, hey, what does it take for you to move from point A to maybe to get to point Z, but along the way, you're going to hit the other 26, wait, 24 other points along the way. Wait, 26, right? Ah, I remember my alphabet. So from A to Z, you're going to have Bs and Cs and Ds, and you're going to go all over the place, uh, but we want you to get there. And so we're going to start with what it talks about in terms of faith. Now, our passage today that Cecilia read is from Mark chapter 4, um, verse 35. And this is a, a, a wonderful story of the disciples. They get in a boat with Jesus. Right? And these disciples, some of them were fishermen, so they knew the sea. They, they understood water. They lived on the water. Right? And they knew what it was uh, to, to fish and be in the midst of a storm. And when these guys were in the middle of that storm, these fishermen, experienced fishermen, they knew they were in trouble. 
Now, they're not, they're professional people at sea. When they say we're in trouble, you better believe you're, it's like the captain on your cruise ship. When you've ever gone on a cruise and the captain says, oh, guys, we're in trouble, right? Uh, you, you know you're in trouble. So these guys are in trouble and Jesus is sleeping in the boat. And they, they go, go get Jesus because we don't know what to do. We're in trouble. And Jesus is taking a nap. And, you, you know, God takes naps, right? God man here takes naps, right? And, and so he's taking a nap. And they wake him up. And Jesus calms the storm with his words, right? And he also gives it to his disciples. And he said, why are you afraid? Why do you have no faith? So there are some of us here today, this is our starting point. We don't have faith. We have no faith in God. We have no faith in Jesus. We have no idea of what this is. Maybe we do have the intellectual things. We kind of know historical facts and figures about Christianity. But many of us, when it comes to the things that happen in life, we actually have zero faith. In fact, many of us, if we want to, if you want to look at our world today, many of us trust more in ourselves than we would trust in Jesus. We trust in our own abilities, in our own intellect. We trust in our own finances. We trust in our own uh, successes that say, I have more faith in myself than I would in God, than I would in Jesus. And so many of us, this is our starting point, is that we are like the disciples. Now, the disciples are with Jesus. They've been with him for a bit now. They kind of gotten to know him a little. They've heard some of his teaching. And yet, when something happened, they still had no faith. And that's what Jesus was getting at. And so maybe that's the starting point for you today, is that maybe you're a person that has no faith. Maybe you're this. Maybe you're a person of little faith. If you have your Bible, I want to take you to Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse Verses 5 to 10. So Matthew 15, uh, sorry, 16, verses 5 to 10. Here's Jesus, um, and Jesus is talking with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he tells his disciples this in verse 6. He says, Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, uh, We brought no bread. Okay? And Jesus is looking at them, and he's, he told them that, you know, you don't need to bring anything. Don't bring anything. And the disciples were like, oh, no, we forgot to bring bread. Okay? And so now Jesus looks at them and says, you men of little faith, why do you discuss amongst yourselves that you have no bread? And what's interesting about that passage is, before this, you have Jesus feeding 5,000 people with a snack, with bread. And, and you have this, this moment that these disciples, they've seen that miracle. They've seen how God turned, you know, these loaves and fishes into a meal for over 5,000 plus people. This little snack fed 5,000 plus people. They saw that miracle take place. And yet here they are again going, um, Jesus, we don't have bread and what this is an example of is that many of us have this as our life. In others, we have little faith. We have very little faith. We only can believe if we see big signs and big wonders. So the disciples believed Jesus when they saw the feeding of the 5,000. And they said, oh, yeah, that's amazing. But when it came to the simple thing, they were like, oh, they don't have any more faith. They just had, they just had a little faith. Only, how, has anyone ever said this? God, if you gave me a sign... I would believe you, right? Because we have little faith. We need something extraordinary, something out of the ordinary before we can maybe have a, a level of faith. And so this is the example of people who may have a little faith. Now, flip over a bit more to your left to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 gives us a story of someone else. Um, it's the story of a centurion. And the backdrop to the story is that his, his child is sick and he sends word to Jesus that, you know, Jesus, I need you to heal my child. They're sick. They're on the verge of dying, right? And, and so this centurion, this army official, um, comes to Jesus saying, hey, uh, please heal my child. And 
he doesn't even ask for Jesus to go with him. Jesus, they're like, you know, what if we just, we can't, we'll come with you, we'll lay hands on the child and he'll be healed. And he says to Jesus, no, Jesus, all you need to do is say the words and my child will be healed. Just say the word. And then Jesus commends him and he says to him in verse uh, 10, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, With no one in Israel have I found such faith. This is a person who didn't have to believe in this big miracle to prove something. He believed that simply if Jesus did this, it's going to come to fruition. It'll happen. He completely trusted Jesus. He didn't require any proof from Jesus that he could do something like that. He just simply believed. He just simply had faith. And then Jesus commends him as he has a great faith. And some of us are here where we don't even need to take a second guess about what Jesus is going to do in our lives. We just know, right? We just know because we've experienced enough or we know him enough that we just know and we don't need him to prove anything. And we just simply know that, you know, I'm just going to ask and it'll be given and boom, right? And, And so some of us come with this. Now, the last one, is in Luke uh, 23. In Luke 23, Jesus offers a prayer. Jesus offers a prayer uh, to Peter, and it's in verse 31 and 32. Oh, sorry, I'm in Luke 22. Sorry, not 23. Luke 22, verses 31 to 32. So he says to Peter, Simon, Simon, Peter, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like weak. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Some of us, our starting point is we have no faith. Some of us were in the camp of we have a little faith. Some of us are in the camp where we have great faith. And some of us are in the camp where we have failing faith. That we've been in this and, and the troubles and the challenges of life have gotten to us so greatly that it's caused us to waver, caused us to question. We don't really know. Or maybe you grew up in church and you have, and, and along the way, somebody did something or, or, or you just drifted away and, and your faith has just been failing and floundering. And Jesus identifies that this is a very real thing, that your faith can fail. People will have a failing faith. We fail to trust God. And again, we will move and we will drift into being more about trusting ourselves or trusting in all sorts of other possibilities out there rather than God. And that's one of the reasons why our faith starts to decline and our faith starts to fail. But why do we need to talk about faith and what's the reason for faith? And see, a lot of times we have this very personal idea that faith is just to help me be a better person or faith is just what we're supposed to have because that's what I was taught always growing up in church or, or faith is just uh, the, 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 the thing to do. We, why do we need to have faith? What's the reason behind the very fact that we need to have some kind of faith in God? Why bother with this? And the very fact of this, the, the very reason why we need to have faith is really so that we can really be used by God. It's not about me growing. It's not about me achieving a certain level. It's really about being available to be, available to be used by God because the more faith you have in God, the more trust you have in God, and the more trust you have in God, the greater things that you can do on behalf of God. You know, oftentimes one of the great tragedies in churches is that many people worry about burning out. You know, you get involved in church, you start serving, and you worry, oh, I'm going to get burnt out. And, and that language is prevalent in our church. We're worried about people burning out. And, I, you know, there's one antidote to burnout. It's a very strange antidote. It's trusting God in faith when you start doing outreach. It's trusting God in faith when you start doing outreach because trusting God in faith in doing outreach is the very fact that you can't control anything and that God is ultimately in control of another person's life and drawing them to himself. 
But you know why you get burnt out? It's because when you're only with each other, you take advantage of each other, you take each other for granted, you complain to each other, and you only do things for each other, and you only rely on what you know and who you are and what you can do. And of course, there's no need for faith in that. And that's why we get burnt out. It's a really weird dynamic, isn't it, if you really think about it. And if you're worried about burnout, here, here's the solution, church. If we're worried about burnout, just reorient ourselves to doing things in faith where we have to reach others in complete faith that God is going to do that. And we won't have to be sitting here complaining about each other, burning out each other, taking each other for granted because we won't be relying on each other anymore. We'd be relying on God in faith. So the very primary reason that God gives us great faith is that we would respond to him in that proportion that we would trust him. And if we have strong faith, he can entrust us with greater assignments that we will have a greater impact on his kingdom. That's what uh, uh, Dr. Charles Stanley said, and I quoted him on that. So what is a saving faith? We have all these different examples of faith. See, a saving faith is the one thing today um, that many of us, I think, we lose sight of. The saving faith, again, is that relational faith that we have, that relational trust that we have in Jesus. That Jesus died for my sin. He was crucified on a cross, died for my sin, rose again after three days, and all my sin has been taken care of. All my issues have been taken care of by Christ and Christ alone. And it's that I now want to pursue after him. I want to live my life of faith. I want to follow after him. What does he want with my life? How does he want me to live my life? How, what is he going to do that's so great in my life? And I'm just going to follow that in a relational step, getting in the, in the Bible, getting uh, in a relationship of prayer with Jesus. And that's part of that saving faith. Now, that's the starting point for many of us. If you have no faith, to put your faith in Jesus. If you have little faith, re-examine your faith in Jesus. If you have great faith, look again at the cross. Never lose sight of the gospel message. And if you have a failing faith, again, go back to that saving faith. It's the foundation faith of everything that we can do here. You can never lose sight of the gospel. And one of the things that a true mark of a disciple is, is someone who can articulate the gospel in both word and in action. Never, ever lose sight of the gospel. You know, one of the tragedies I've always heard uh, Christians say is that, oh, I, already, I know the gospel. I know it. Right? And I said, that can be just an intellectual thing that you know. A lot of us know it, but very few of us live it living out this gospel faith. And we need to continually always re-examine that in ourselves. Now, how do I know if I have a saving faith? I'm going to read to you some questions that you can think through. And if you can answer yes uh, to a majority of these questions, there's 12 questions, so let's say a majority is seven. If you answer yes to seven of them, you're on your way, right? But if you don't, this is not a judgment. I don't know everything about what's going on in your life. And please don't take this as a judgment to you. But play, take this as a conviction that maybe you need to re-examine where you are in this saving faith of Jesus Christ. So the first question is this. Do you enjoy fellowship with Christ, part A? Do you enjoy fellowshipping with Christ? And if that is an abstract idea, then maybe you're missing out. But that's part A. Do you enjoy fellowshipping with Christ, but do you enjoy fellowshipping with his saved people? It's one thing to love Jesus. It's another thing to love his church, the people. Where are you with that? Would you say you walk in light or do you hide more in darkness? Have you ever been able to admit and confess your sin to Jesus and to others? That's a hard one there. Have you been able to admit and confess your sin, your sin to Jesus and to others? Are you obedient to God's word? Well, really, are you in God's word? And are you following through in action? Does your life indicate that you love God first and foremost? Or are there other things that take over your love for God? Whether it's things in the world, your job, your kids, your spouse, any other things. Is your life characterized by doing what is right? Do you seek to maintain a life of holiness? 
has there been a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? You know that secret sin that nobody knows that you do, but God knows, and somehow we think we can still hide from God, but God actually already knows? You know that one? Has that been decreasing in your life? I mean, I'm not saying get rid of it altogether right away, and hope, we hope that you can, but has it been decreasing, or has it been increasing? Do we demonstrate love for others? Simple one that we all hear. Do we walk the walk versus just talking this talk? How clear is your conscience in all your actions you undertake? Do you know the joy of the victory in Jesus Christ? Now, these questions are to probe and to convict each and every one of us to say, where are we on this journey of faith? We're just beginning. And this is our first in our series. And if you've been able to answer truthfully yes to a majority of these questions, you're you're doing well on that. And we want to encourage you to keep going forward in that. If you struggled with a lot of those questions, if you struggled with a lot of those questions, this is not a condemnation for you, but a challenge to get back in to that relationship with Jesus, not this intellectual knowledge of Jesus and his saving grace. We had, a, we had dinner with a friend not too long ago, and uh, she's been a Christian for decades, grew up in the church. And um, one of the things that they were sharing with us was some of their struggles, and, and I, we looked her straight in the eye, I looked her straight in the eye, I said, you know, one of the things that you really need to do is really just offer grace to more people in your life. And she turned around and she says, I don't know what that means. We said, we said but, but you have Jesus. That, that's the ultimate example of grace. And she goes, but I, I still don't know what that means. And she grew up in church, and she serves in church. She's a faithful Christian, and I don't doubt any of that. But I think what she spoke to me is where many of us in our journey with Christ really are, is that we really don't know I mean, faith is a word we think we know, but we really sometimes just don't. We can't articulate well. We, we don't know exactly where, uh, how, how we feel about it. We don't know how we think about it. And I give her as an example to you saying that she is like every one of us, many of us in this room who say, yeah, I, I know the grace of Jesus, but I just don't know, you know? And the truth is, is that if we're honest with that as our starting point today, that the journey begins. And that if you're honest with where you're starting at, you don't need to have this, you don't need to be at this super level Christian faith. We're not asking you to be at uh, level 16. I don't even know how many levels there are, but let's just start at 16. You don't have to be there. Some of us are starting at level, honestly, negative 10, right? Some of us are at negative 10. Some of us are at zero And some of us are at five. But my hope is that you would identify where you're at today with Jesus in terms of your faith. Looking at these scriptural examples of these kinds of faiths. And is the foundation of your saving faith really there? So that you would begin this journey of faith as we go through this series together over this next while. So facing life with faith. Would you pray with me together this morning as we close off? God, we are thankful for the very fact that you are a God who has loved on us much more and much greater than we have ever responded in kind. And today I want to thank you that um, we can start off a new year examining ourselves and challenging where we are in our walk with you. Lord, I pray that today the truth of your word, the truth of your conviction would impact us, that we would be honest and truthful with where we are with you. So God, today I pray uh, that you will speak very clearly to each and every one of us, that we don't need to be embarrassed or ashamed, just need to be honest, and that, Lord, we can begin the journey this year, 2018, in following you in this life of faith. 
And so today I pray for the saving faith in each and every one of us. May the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, may that never, ever grow weary or tired in each and every one of us. I pray for those of us who haven't yet had that relationship with Jesus Christ, that we haven't put our trust, our full trust in you, that you have paid the penalty of my sin. I pray for anyone here today that, God, you will speak that truth into their life today and bring conviction in their life. That we don't have to earn our way to you. We don't have to to fight our way to you. We don't have to um, do all these good things to get to you, that you've already done that for us. And we need to simply trust in that. So God, would you do your work in each and every one of our lives today? We ask in Jesus' name, amen.